The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. This is a major pre-migration roost for the purple martins. It's like a hurricane of birds. One of my favorite stories is called The Black Bears of Black Gap. The biologists uh, in this story are husband and wife, and they are a hoot. You go do this, and they say, well, that don't work for you. <laughs> we get along. We do what they call shoreline cleanup and assessment, and we look for oil. outside for 30 years. Oh look, there's Haymont. Andy and Julia Belinsky are landlords in Austin. In January, we get these housing units all ready. Today, they are checking on the welfare of some tenants. Hey, Haymont. With their yeah. friend Haymont, they manage a housing complex. We have to clean them out. We have to uh, purchase new structures from time to time some maintenance. But all this happens on a small scale. The three are landlords for a colony of purple martins. They are the largest North American swallow, a subgroup of that family called the martins, which are a type of swallow. However, unlike some swallows, which raise young in houses they construct themselves, purple martins need existing cavities in order to nest. So the birds have become increasingly reliant on people to provide housing. It's a relationship that dates back centuries. Native Americans put up gourds long, long ago, and this, this bird associates safety with humans. Humans keep the snakes away. There are fewer snakes and hawks and owls, so they just more or less refuse to nest away from human activity. Landlords know many ways to deter predators, and they also know how to evict bad neighbors. Take it out. Without some help, the martins would be run out of their homes by non-native birds like house sparrows. They're pretty nasty. They'll go in and peck the purple martin eggs. They'll be mean to the babies. It's bad news, so we discourage them from being here, and that's the part of the responsibility. Sparrow nests are easy to spot but no one wants to evict babies. No eggs. So landlords must remove nests frequently during the spring. So we're done here. We live 20 minutes away, but we do try to make it every five days, if, if at all possible. Purple Martins also do some traveling. They spend winter in South America and return to North America each spring to breed. Reaching Texas in late January and February, and as far north as Canada by May. Landlords lay out the welcome mat by offering clean, vacant, semi-furnished units. We put a bed of pine needles in each compartment, and when the nesting starts, they, the purple martins themselves will bring leaves. After that, the real work begins. How, how many eggs did we have in F? We pull their nests down and count eggs. Seven, still seven. Native birds are protected by federal and state laws, so eggs and nestlings should not be handled without proper training and permits. But careful nest checks can benefit purple martins. Some of it is actually directly helping the martins, like sometimes we have to throw out a rotten egg that could break and bring some disease or change out a nest that's crawling with mites. 
we not only help birds in raising the family, but also we help the scientific community to gather data. The information these and many other landlords collect is passed along to the Purple Martin Conservation Association to yield a better understanding of species health and management across its range. I'm not a scientist myself, but this is a chance to be a citizen scientist. All right, now we leave them alone. And they're coming back? And they're coming back. Clearly being a landlord takes some work. So since the birds pay no rent, what exactly are the dividends? Listen to this song. It's just a magical sound. They have so many different sounds. Just up the road in Temple, Alan Newman has been enjoying Purple Martin's song for more than two decades. I've been a Purple Martin landlord for 24 years. Right now I have 83 young ones and 54 adults. They're talking to their young. They're telling them to keep their heads down, to behave. <laughs> They're a, a good bird to have. Now, they don't get the ground mosquitoes, but they'll get a lot of other insects as they feed. I just enjoy being around the birds, and it's really nice seeing all that new life generated year after year. Oh, look at you, sweetie babies. Back in Austin, those eggs have yielded newborn martins. When they unfold out of that egg, even on the day they hatch, they don't seem to fit. <laughs> Within a month, even the tiniest of these hatchlings will be learning to fly. By summer's end, the birds will head south. But before they leave, the martins put on an impressive show in Austin. When the babies have all fledged, the purple martins from further north of here they congregate at Highland Mall for about a month. It's amazing. They come in on the same trees every day. In July, Purple Martins converge nightly on a few trees in this North Austin parking lot. They're starting to come in like right now. This is a major pre-migration roost for the Purple Martins. After they've raised their babies, they start grouping up into large groups in preparation for flying south to South America. Wow, this is so incredible. The community of birds also draws a community of onlookers. Ooh, I see one. At its peak, the spectacle rivals Austin's famed bat colony. We've had numerous people tell us this is cooler than the bats. It's so big, you can see it on Doppler radar. Pretty impressive. There's like layers upon layers of them. Though Andy, Julia, and Haymont lost some of their Martin babies to an extreme June heat wave, their caring management helped dozens more survive. 172 birds basically are out here, new birds this year, because of that colony that we took care of. So we definitely are responsible for some portion of that. I'm sure our birds are among these. Those three, that one, over there on the, left. Uh, that one <laughs> the 700th one from the left. It's like a hurricane of birds. And perhaps here too are some future caretakers. Mom, this is really cool. To help ensure these birds will always have a place to call home. Oh, whoa. That is a lot of birds. That's really cool. March 22nd, 2014, we had two vessels that collided in the Houston Ship Channel. There was a timing issue with an incoming inbound ship and a barge and tug crossing the channel. The crew members started reporting that they had oil leaking from the barge. We had about 170,000 gallons of fuel that was spilled into the ship channel. Any large spill like this, we get notified by the Coast Guard or the General Land Office to come and assist in it as a role of a natural resource advisor. Since it was a large event, we did pull people from Austin, from Corpus, even down from Brownsville. We had folks coming in uh, to help us. Okay. 
We all came from different offices, but we were able to coordinate and work effectively together, as well as the different federal agencies that were at the incident command. One of the challenges was quickly finding areas that needed the highest priority protection. At the time of year, we were starting to get a lot of uh, migration coming through. A lot of our shorebirds were on the beaches utilizing them for feeding. So that was a big challenge. As the oil traveled down the Houston Ship Channel, it went out into the Gulf. The trajectory was for the spill to actually hit the southern portion of Matagorda Island. You need a boat in order to access it. And then once you get onto the island during this time, there were endangered species. And so transportation and access to the site were quite difficult. This area it was hit particularly hard and we had a pretty significant staining of oil on the beaches, about anywhere from three to eight feet wide. Probably about an inch thick in some spots. We do what they call shoreline cleanup and assessment. We walk up and down the beaches and we look for oil, assessing to see if any of that oil had actually been covered up and to see if there was any remnant of oil underneath the surface. And it was pretty emotional seeing a lot of the oiled birds that we were collecting. When we had captured a live oiled loon and we were putting the loon in the cage and it gave its little cry, that was something that, that really uh, got to me. That's gonna be one thing I remember about that spill, that cry of that bird. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of overtime, it's a lot of hours, but we all work together and, and work for the better. The cleanup crew did a good job of cleaning everything up. They did it in an, a quick manner. I've seen how resilient our coastline is. Since then, the, the beach has really recovered. They are very, very special. One, two, and basically gave up just about everything they had in their personal life for almost a month just to be out there to, to help protect the resources of, of the state of Texas. It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Bruce Bierman is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. My name is Bruce Bierman and I've been with the television series for 24 years as a producer. One of my favorite stories is called The Black Bears of Black Gap. Uh, I was following two of our biologists as they did a study of black bears out in West Texas. One of the bears that they captured, I was able to be there for that event. And when the bear was knocked out and they were processing it, uh, studying it, I had finally recorded yeah, enough and I, here, I put down the camera and I said, can I touch the bear? And they're like, yeah, sure. I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd be able to touch a black bear, let alone because it was knocked out, I was able to get down and smell its breath as it was breathing and it was snoring. What a wonderful life experience. The biologists uh, in this story are husband and wife, and they are a hoot. Yeah, that, that scat looks like it's got you corn it or something up? in it. It's so mushy. You can't... So I hope you enjoy this story. I really enjoyed producing it. I'm Bonnie McKinney, and I live on the Black Gap Wildlife Management Area, which is down along the Mexican border. Mama Bear has moved. Maybe make a complete circle around. Maybe she's right back in there. It's very faint. We have a research project going on here on the Black Gap Wildlife Management Area. We have seven bears collared. Got her. Yeah, he's right there. Yeah. You can just swing back around there again. A natural recovery by any wildlife species, very seldom does it naturally recover without man helping it along. And the bears have just literally decided to make West Texas their home again and are actually moving back into this country from northern Mexico. So it's up to us to kind of help them in any way that we can and we need to learn something about these bears. Look over there, what's that on, wait, what's that on the ridge? Stop, stop, look. I think it's on top because... Yeah, she's right on the top. It's where huh? she's at. She's right on the top. 
No, but I can hear them. You can put the antenna right there. We're studying there. home range, diet, habitats, uh, mortalities, and we also want to be able to provide management techniques for private landowners uh, that are now finding themselves living with the black bear in West Texas. Some of our colleagues and peers, they sort of look at you and say, you don't really have black bears on Black Gap, do you? Well, yeah, we've got seven bears collared. Oh, come on, you know, what do they eat? Well, they eat Spanish dacker and soto and yucca, and they, they sort of shake their head and say, it's just amazing, we can't believe that. Well, come down, visit the study site, and we'll take you out. <laughs> Bear. Bonnie does a lot of different things. She does a lot of cactus surveys and bird work. Uh, right now, a lot of stuff is taking Bonnie's time up is this bear research program that's going on in the Black Gap Wildlife Area right now. Well, I'm the boss, but uh, he bosses. And, and sometimes there's little deals, you know, like you go do this, and they say, well, I don't work for you. And <laughs> we get along. You know how marriage is. Well, we've lived on the Gap uh, almost 20 years. And uh, there's kind of a joke, when we moved to the Gap, uh, he said, oh, you'll love over there, there's lots of trees, lots of water. Well, you couldn't get more desert than Black Gap, so actually we met on the Black Gap. You can look around here and there's not a lot of women in this country, so you, <laughs> you make opportunities where you can. I guess you could say charmed me. I actually caught her stealing cactus, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, life sentence. I try to make the best of it here, so. It's not always peaches and cream, that's for sure. Uh, he really didn't charm me, guys. Bonnie's a strong-willed person. I'm set in my ways, and... Uh, <laughs> it's really been a life sentence. <laughs> we love the solitude out here. Um, if we get in an argument, we can certainly scream our heads off and not worry about the neighbors hearing about us, but... Uh, it's actually about 85 miles to an area where you can get a good selection of groceries and things. And uh, that's an hour and a half drive one way. And that's an extra $20 added onto your uh, food bill. We also disagree on a lot of things, but uh, being a husband and wife, we work it out. Yeah, it can be crazy and different working with your wife, but it's it's really a good job. Bye. The bears move around till about 11 o'clock when it gets real hot, so uh, we go check traps early in the morning. Okay, this is a f uh, fun part of bear trapping, resetting the barrels. The guys have refused to crawl in here on their tummies and rebate for me. Hey, I'm gonna use a commercial bait. It's a strawberry flavored bait. Ouch. Bear comes in here, he can't resist it. They love sweet stuff. He'll flip this little trigger and he tries to get this bait bag and we catch a bear. You see a bear out here in this country and they've been gone so long and then to have them back, uh, it's a pretty incredible deal. And it's also, uh, putting back a part of Texas that was gone, that we thought was gone forever. Uh, they're back. Come on out and, and bring those drugs as quick as you can. I'm in route. We got a bear in a tree up there in Alpine. I need that stuff. 10-4, uh, we're on our way. We just got a call from Alpine that there's a bear in a tree at Alpine, and uh, I've got the drug kit with me. Yeah, Bill is uh, in route, and uh, Don's gone up to pick up the covert trap. So we are on the way. She should stay up the tree, hopefully. And we'll dart her, then probably get her down with ropes. Get out of the way. Mitch, you gotta mix it. I got it mixed right here. Oh, okay. Hold this right here. How big is that bear? He's right he's there. He's an adult bear. Okay. You wanna, if he falls, you wanna put him in tarp? And I was out fooling around in the yard, and I looked up in this tree, 
and uh, there was a bear in the tree. So I'll go in and tell my wife, and um, she didn't believe me, of course. She had to come out and look. Good shot. Well, he'll go down in a minute. He's in a perfect tree, because when he falls, he'll just hit those branches, and it'll break his fall all the way down. OK, y'all get, get back a little bit. We're going to drop him down. We're going to attempt to drop him down. <laughs> ready? Hang on. That's a big bear. Oh. Take that magnet off. This is cool. Talk about you got to touch him? No. Y'all need to stay back. Bears are all wild animals. They're not. OK, I need tip of his nose. Right on the tip. Right down the middle center of his back. We need more tape. <laughs> Greg, we need to get that blood. Ear tagging. Okay. We put the tracking collars on these bear because we want to determine their home ranges and compare it to other studies in the United States. Uh, I expect us to find some pretty exciting information out. And uh, without the tracking collars, we wouldn't know as much about what was going on. <laughs> especially about individual animals. Collar's plenty loose. He's snoring. He have a wet towel. My daddy snores. He does. He goes, oh, oh, oh. What do you guys think we should call this bear, huh? Let's Big bear. Really neat Black, Black bear. No, come Big on. Bear. Papa bear. Come Big bear. Come on. You have to get him something to wake him up or what? No, this drug is a, is a drug that's uh, really good for bears. He'll wake up, he'll be really groggy and... He's not really a problem bear. Uh, really didn't do any damage or tear anything up. It's just that uh, we, we really moved him for his protection, not for people's protection. wasn't a problem bear or a nuisance bear. So there's no problem with him going anywhere as far as, I mean, he's not a, not a problem. But we'll monitor his movement. A lot of times a relocated bear doesn't stay in the area that you put him in. So we'll get out and do lots of ground telemetry in the next couple of days with this big guy. OK, what we got here is a rope tied to our guillotine gate so we can let this bear loose without anybody being around it for safety reasons and also because he might come out a little better if he's not anybody standing around to open the gate. Well, all we got to do is turn him loose now. I wonder if he'll stay in here. We'll be up here. I'll come up early in the morning and run telemetry on him, see what he's doing. He'll probably sleep off pretty much the rest of the afternoon. It's almost a comforting feeling to know that black bears are out here in this country and they're, they're moving around at night, they're feeding, they're raising their young uh, after being gone for so long, that they're actually coming back. It kind of soothes my soul, if you will say, that this animal has come back. Basically, he's done it on his own. Hopefully we can give him some help to go ahead and finish his expansion into historic range. But to me, I, it just, it just uh, is a good feeling. I really think that a lot of people are gonna get that same feeling, that, that we have this animal here, and that maybe we're doing something right on Wildlife Management Mary to have this animal here.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.